Uh, basically, my goals are these. Uh, I want you to understand releases, like what their purpose is and how, what their benefits are. Um, be able to leave here knowing how to use them with your project. Um, it's really simple to get started, a couple minutes of your time, um, and you can start using them today, basically. Um, I'm also going to cover how to use Conform. Um, it's a configuration management library. Um, I'll explain a little bit more what it does, but its point is to give you a little bit richer, more powerful configuration in production. Uh, so a quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about uh, is a little bit of an OTP refresher, just to make sure we're all on the same page about what applications are, how they're structured, um, how do we deploy Elixir apps without releases, um, what are releases, how do we use them, um, and then configuration management with and without conform. So OTP applications. Um, really, the essence of them is that they have a well-defined structure um, and life cycle. So that's the behaviors that we're familiar with, like gen server, gen event. Um, the life cycle is the start and stop, uh, code changes, stuff like that. They have explicit dependencies. So in your mix EXS, you're defining exactly what your application depends on. Uh, and then there's also useful metadata about those applications, right? So you have a name, a version, um, what modules are exported, what functions are exported from those modules, um, what applications are included in yours. Um, this is kind of a quick visualization. I borrowed this off of Google. Uh, it's just a kind of an over overview of the React Core uh, application, just a subset of it. Um, you're all kind of familiar with, you know, this top-level app is responsible for bootstrapping the supervision tree of your application, right? Um, so you have your application behavior, uh, your core supervisor, and then that's starting here, like color-coded purple are the supervisors, yellow are your workers. So you've got supervisors that start their children, supervisors, and children workers, and so on down the tree. Uh, and this has that well-defined life cycle that I was talking about when you start your application. It starts its core supervisor, which starts everything else below it. Um, and then when you stop it, it's the same thing. It sends um, all the stop commands down the tree. Um, if you've got like a branch that dies somewhere in there, your supervisor is restarting that. That's stuff that we're kind of familiar with working with um, Elixir and Erlang applications. But it's kind of important just to keep that in mind when we're discussing releases. Um, another thing to keep in mind is the difference between uh, process-based applications and library applications, they're effectively the same thing from Erlang's point of view as far as defining them, right? Um, you're still defining the name and the version. Um, they're explicit as a dependency in your application. Um, the only difference between process-based and library applications is the lifecycle. Uh, library applications are just exporting modules with functions that you call, but there's no processes within them. Okay. So, release management uh, with our releases. Uh, this is kind of probably what most of you are doing today. Um, I think probably a few of you maybe are using releases, I'm not sure, but uh, the idea is that on your production box, you have to install Elixir and Erlang and potentially other dependencies such as OpenSSL if you're using like the crypto application. Uh, you have to find a way to deploy your code, your application to the target system. So you're either tarring up your project and deploying it, uh, Git cloning it, um, which would require Git on your server, that kind of thing. Uh, you're configuring it once you've got it in production and then running it or building it with your correct environment set so that your configuration is correct, um, and then starting it up with mix run. Uh, I've got a note here about the fact that this can be automated. You know, there's uh, Docker files available now that I've seen. Uh, there's a Heroku build pack. Uh, I know somebody is doing some work with Ansible, that kind of thing. So this is uh, obviously less than ideal because um, you have to have development dependencies in production. You're doing builds in production. That's not great. Uh, if you have to have multiple applications on one server and you have varying dependencies on versions of Erlang and Elixir, that's difficult if possible, or if not even possible, with uh, this approach. Uh, there's no out-of-the-box way to automatically restart your application if it fails. Uh, 
Uh, you're going to have to use something like Upstart or write your own scripts around this. Uh, it's just not great. Um, there's a nice, it's nice to have like a guideline for how to approach these problems. Uh, you can't use hot upgrades and downgrades. You can reload modules manually, um, but obviously that doesn't work very well. So you're going to end up doing rolling restarts, which might be a good fit anyways, but it's nice to have the option available. Um, this also does not work on some platforms, uh, particularly embedded, where there might be read-only file systems. Um, you can't do that with this approach at all. So what does better look like? Uh, your applications want to be self-contained uh, with all their dependencies in this package. Um, you don't want to have to have any tooling installed in production, um, ideally. That's kind of something everybody's familiar with doing already, but better is trying to get away from that. Uh, this helps you run things side by side and so on. You also want a way to manage your application's lifecycle um, out of the box. You don't want to have to have yet another library or a set of tools to manage this, if possible. You want to be able to use hot upgrades or downgrades. Um, you want to be able to cross-compile to your target system. This is more applicable maybe if you're deploying to like Raspberry Pi, uh, Arduino, something like that. Um, you want to be able to achieve this somehow without having to build on the target system, if that's even possible. You want to have easy deployment. You know, drop a package on a server, extract it, run it. Simple as that. Um, and you also want reproducible artifacts from your builds, right? So if you build your project, you want to be able to take that on n many uh, target systems uh, of the same architecture and easily deploy those. Uh, the problem with running like the mix run approach is when you copy everything to the server, there might be minor differences. Um, if you're not very careful about how you version your dependencies, you might get different versions of your dependencies. It's not great. So better is effectively OTP releases, right? Uh, they're self-contained. They have all their dependencies. Uh, they have the Erlang runtime system included. Um, that's optional, but by default, that's the case. Uh, they have built-in lifecycle management, uh, so that's starting, stopping, restarting, um, upgrading, downgrading, all that's built in. Um, there's also health monitoring, so if your application actually crashes, uh, if you use um, an application called Heart, uh, which is baked into releases, uh, this will monitor the heartbeat of the Erlang runtime system hosting your application and restart it if it needs to. Uh, there's hot upgrades and downgrades baked in, as I mentioned. Um, easy cross compilation. All you have to do is reference a compiled version of the Erlang runtime system uh, for your target system, which is uh, there's packages for most target systems that you want to uh, cross compile for already. You just download those, reference that in your configuration, and boom, ready to go. Uh, easy deployment. Uh, it comes as a tarball, so you just extract on your target system and basically Ben's app name uh, run, you know. Uh, also easily reproduced because the artifact is a tarball that has all of its explicit version dependencies. Uh, once you've built this release, it never changes. It's immutable. So what exactly is release? It's a set of versioned OTP applications. So these aren't. Uh, like rough dependency versions. This is like explicit exact versions of all your uh, applications that your uh, app depends on. So this is not just your application and its direct dependencies, but also all transient dependencies, uh, including Erlang and Elixir applications. Uh, it's got the Erlang runtime system included. Um, contains release metadata um, on how to start your application, meaning in what order applications are started up um, and shut down. There's an explicit configuration mechanism. That's uh, the sysconfig, which is what uh, config.exs ultimately is compiled into. Um, there's a vm.args file for providing arguments to the emulator. There are scripts for managing the release. This is how you get the start, stop, restart, upgrade, downgrade uh, functionality. And then ultimately, this is all rolled up into a tarball. So this is a 
brief overview of what the release structure looks like. Uh, at the top level, you just have your application. Uh, the bin directory includes the boot scripts for how to start uh, the app, but these are uh, basically really thin layers that reference the bin directory under uh, releases version. Uh, there will be the actual boot script for that version in there. Uh, the ERTS library, if you're including it, uh, will be referenced here uh, with the explicit version. Um, the lib directory contains all the applications, all the beam files to those, uh, including anything stored in priv. So if you're deploying a release of like a Phoenix application, um, all your assets and stuff will be included in there. Uh, the releases folder is all release specific information. So this is where your configuration is stored, uh, the uh, rel up files, app ups, uh, sysconfig, vm.args, uh, the Erlang boot script, and uh, no tool stuff. This is all mostly hidden from view for you. Uh, if you're consuming releases, it's more important for uh, the release handler when it's unpacking a release and installing it. Um, this is where it grabs a lot of its information from. And ultimately, how do you use releases? Um, I wrote XRM uh, when I was interested in trying to use releases with Elixir applications. Uh, XRM is built on Relics, which is basically the equivalent tool for Erlang apps. Uh, so I'm extending that by pulling Relics in as a library and then writing some uh, Elixir code over the top. So it provides mixed tasks, like mixed release is basically the primary task you'll use uh, with XRM. And uh, there's some cleanup scripts and stuff like that as well. Uh, it provides automatic app up generation. So this is particular to hot upgrades and downgrades. <clears throat> but uh, this is something that wasn't baked into Relics. And there's somewhat of a reason for that, because app ups are particular to your application and how things are upgraded. But there's like a 90% use case where the app ups that are generated by XRM um, will suffice. Uh, if you're in a more complex situation, then um, you have to reference the existing Erlang documentation today called the App Up Cookbook, which tells you how to approach modifying app ups generated by XRM um, in order to handle upgrades or downgrades uh, more precisely. There's also a plugin system. So uh, right now, there's a couple different hooks that are executed. Um, the plugins are exposed as a behavior. And um, one of the ones I can think of off the top of my head was written by uh, Stephen Palin, who did uh, RPM uh, plugin that generates an RPM package from a release. Um, and there also provides some intelligent defaults that aren't provided out of the box with Relics. So there's a default Relics config that is generated based on information I'm able to pull from mixed EXS and some other data. Um, also provides a default vm.args and so on. Uh, so some of the things that this provides is uh, like setting the cookie and the name for the node so that when you're deploying this, you can just remote console to it without having to configure anything. So overview of what the release process really looks like. What is XRM doing under the covers, right? Uh, it's reading the configuration for the release. This is the relics.config file that's either generated or provided by the user. Uh, it's then generating that relics config that's merged with the user one. Uh, the sysconfig file that's pulled by uh, reading config.exs uh, based on the environment that was provided, uh, generating a vm.args file, so on. It's then running this before release hook which is part of the plugin system. So this is um, a place where you can provide some of your own code to prep uh, the release as needed. Uh, you don't have to provide a plugin. It's just something that's there. Uh, there's then some discovery that's performed. This is delegated to the Relics library. So at this point, we're calling into Relics. Um, so it looks up all the releases that your application requires. Um, it also takes a look for previous releases that are available, if they exist. It's resolving all those dependencies, like where are those applications? Does, based on the constraints provided, can it locate them? Um, it's in taking all that information and building the release package. And that is dumped to your project root slash rel. Uh, what's output there is the uh, extracted version of what's in the tarball. Um, and then under the releases, like rel, 
my app releases folder where the version is, that's where that tarball gets dumped. Uh, after the package is uh, run, it runs the after release hooks, which allows you to kind of do some post modification of the release package if you want. I'm using this with conform to um, do some extra work after the fact. Uh, and then the release package is repackages the tarball that was generated and then it runs the after package hook. So you could potentially write a plugin to do deployment for you if you wanted. Um, XRM is pretty agnostic about how you deploy release. All it really cares about is generating that release package for you. So real quick, let's take a look at what this looks like, right? So I have cloned like the Elixir Phoenix chat demo um, just because it's a good example of how we can do the hot upgrades and downgrades, um, but I haven't really made any modifications to it really. So when you're going to build your release, um, you've got your code ready to go. Um, you basically just do this. In this case, I want to build with the prod configuration. Uh, you see, it'll compile your app if it hasn't been compiled. Um, and then it kind of summarizes what it's doing for you, so you can monitor it. And it tells you where you're, you're ready to go. Now, you can run your app directly from the rel folder. Um, but in general, I'd recommend not doing that um, outside of development. So there's a mixed release uh, dev flag where uh, your application beams are symlinked into the release, which allows you to effectively test your release um, while you're doing code changes. Um, in this case, I'm going to just quickly uh, deploy to my temp folder. So we just have our tarball here. And this is the structure that I kind of showed you before. Now at this point, all we have to do to run it is start it. And we have our application up, right? Um, so one of the things built into the chat example is the system pings you periodically. Um, so let's say we want to make some code changes to this application. Um, in this case, I've kind of pre-prepared all this um, just to tell you or show you what I've done. I changed the version of the application, like incremented the version number, um, and then changed the system message that it spits out. Now, the thing about hot upgrades and downgrades and the reason why it's really appealing is if you have a bunch of connections to a server, they're ongoing, um, and you want to do an upgrade, you obviously don't want to drop those connections, right? Uh, so in this case, we're going to generate a release containing our updated code. Um, and part of what this process does is when XRM is running and it sees that there's an existing release and that the version number is a new one, um, it will assume that it needs to generate an app up for you. Um, it doesn't have to be used if you're doing rolling releases, but by default, it's just going to say, OK, we want to do an upgrade. So, uh, oops. Where you want to dump these upgraded uh, packages is in the releases folder of your deployment system. Make a new directory for the new version. And then so now that we have our package ready to be uh, upgraded, our system is still running, of course. You know, if we check here, it's still pinging us. Um, we just tell our system to upgrade itself, right? So we'll unpack that uh, package, unpack the configuration, um, and then install the new version. And if we go back and look, it's now telling us a different message. Um, this is really awesome, right? If you've got a bunch of people in here all chatting, you don't want to ruin their day by killing the server. Um, so everybody can carry on as if nothing has changed, but you've made changes on your back end. 
And any new requests that come in, like let's say you change the styles of that page, like you want to make the page uh, you know, blue or something, um, new requests will get all the new styles um, and be connected as normal. The old clients will still be consuming the old front end. Um, there's not really any way to obviously hot upgrade that, at least that I know of. Um, that would be a cool feature of releases if we could do that. Um, if, however, that, down, or that upgrade didn't go well, let's say you're like, oh man, what have we done? I want to go back. You can tell it to downgrade to the previous version, um, and then it's going to go back to doing what it was before. So this is kind of the nice feature of releases, uh, mainly upgrades. Uh, however, uh, it's not the only feature. Obviously, the primary benefit of releases is not the hot upgrades and downgrades. It's a really cool thing. The primary thing is it makes um, your deploying to production so much easier. And everything can now be run side by side, completely isolated. You don't have interdependencies between applications. If you un um, upgrade Erlang on your prod server, you're not potentially breaking something because everything has its own version of Erts right there with it. Um, so configuration of your releases, right? Um, right now, the way configuration works, if you're running with mixed run, uh, config.exs allows you to put function calls and stuff in your configuration. Um, but when a release is built, your config.exs is evaluated at release build time. So if you're expecting this to be dynamic on your prod server, it's not going to be. Um, it's going to take whatever, it, let's say you're reading environment variables, right? It's going to be reading them from your build machine, not your prod machine. Um, so this is sufficient for uh, the base use case, uh, but it's not great for people that aren't programmers. Let's say you have an ops team. They aren't familiar with Elixir or Erlang. Um, they're going to have a hard time configuring this application uh, because they won't know the syntax. Um, the thing to remember, especially with config.exs, is that this is compiled to a sysconfig file. Um, sysconfig is in Erlang terms, not even Elixir terms, so it's something that takes a little bit of adjusting to. Um, ideally, we want our ops teams to not have to think about programming language syntax at, like at all. Um, so we don't have dynamic configuration. We have a configuration based on programming language. It's not great. Sure. Uh, so. That's why I wrote Conform. Um, I was inspired by Cuttlefish, which is a library written by uh, React for React, or Basho for React. Um, it allows you to have more of a init style configuration for your ops teams or even yourself. Um, you basically define a schema, um, and then the end user works with this init style configuration instead of uh, all the complexity behind your real configuration. So you can have a very complicated config, and it can be boiled down to something very simple and easy to consume. Um, so the schema itself has the concept of mappings, transforms, and validators, because that's kind of the three steps of configuration um, when you're transforming the static init file or init style config uh, to the sysconfig consumed by the system. Um, schemas can be extended, so if your dependencies have conform schemas, uh, your application can extend those schemas and then expose the configuration to uh, users of your application. Uh, one of the nice benefits is that you can flip on or off which settings are displayed to users when this, con uh, this comp file is generated. Um, so if you want to have like advanced knobs, you can hide those behind um, your schema, um, allow users that know that those settings exist to tweak those things, but not dump it into like your default configuration file. Uh, there's also a mechanism for providing like documentation, referencing other settings. Um, like let's say you have a couple different settings that all share the same documentation. Uh, you know, your core default setting could have all the documentation, and everything else could reference back to that. Um, and then this configuration is actually merged with config.exs, so this gives you a path for kind of uh, moving to using conform without having to do it all at once. Uh, so anything that's missing when generated by conform uh, is read from config.exs, and then that's all merged together. Conform takes precedence. It's merged over the top of config.exs, but uh, allows you to have those defaults still there. <clears throat> 
So what are mappings? They basically define um, how to map a user-facing setting to your backend setting. Um, and I'll show you uh, shortly here a quick example of like, why you might want to do that. Um, it tells you what the data type of the setting is. So there's a way to say that this value is an atom, or it's a list of atoms, or a list of lists of atoms, and so on. Uh, you can have complex types as well. Um, it also defines default values. If you have ones that are like sane defaults, um, you don't have to provide one. Um, also defines validation rules. So this uses the validators concept that I'll touch on here. Um, but basically, this allows you to say, when somebody provides a value for this setting, run this validator against it, make sure that it's legit before we actually start up the application. Uh, also, yeah, some of these other settings, like whether the setting is hidden from view by default, whether it's commented out by default, um, and then also this is where you define your documentation. Excuse me. What are transforms? These are simple functions. Um, they take a single parameter, which is a reference to the current configuration state, um, and allows you to query that configuration state so you can combine settings, modify existing ones, and so on. Um, it provides sort of a query syntax for this based on wildcards. Um, it's really pretty simple stuff. Um, that's covered in more detail in the documentation. I'm not going to go over that right now. Um, it can execute any Elixir code. So this would be an ideal place to do things like read from the environment, um, read from a file, so on. You can get machine specific, like on the target system, information about it um, when this configuration is evaluated, which when it can use in combi or a combination with releases happens when it's started, upgraded, downgraded. Uh, yeah, those are three times. Um, and then you can package these transforms into modules um, that implement a behavior that's exposed. This way you can keep your schema file pretty simple with just mappings um, and then reference these modules that implement the callback. Validators are much the same way. Um, in this case, it receives the value that needs to be validated um, and then optional arguments. Um, conform provides a range validator, kind of an example, but it's, you could use it to validate ranges. Um, that takes the range to be validated against as an argument. Um, args to a validator passes an array as a second parameter or a list. Um, and then validators need to return one of three things, right? Um, there's going to be cases where you might want to warn that the setting provided is like it's valid, but maybe a little extreme, and you want to warn the user about that. So warnings are treated as OK but a message will be printed when the configuration is evaluated. Um, and then you return OK or an error if need be. Uh, if an error occurs during validation, uh, the configuration evaluation will stop, that message will be printed, and the user will have to fix it before they can continue. Um, an interesting note about that, actually. Uh, when used with releases, if you're doing an upgrade or a downgrade, um, and the configuration is evaluated and something is invalid or there's an error, uh, the upgrade or downgrade won't be executed. So you won't be like in this weird state where it's like half, you know, you've done the upgrade and now it's trying to do the configuration. Configuration is evaluated before the upgrade is installed. So a quick overview of how conform works. Uh, there's a .conf file. Uh, that's the user facing conf. It parses that. Um, it then maps the settings from their source to their target, um, and then runs a validation against those mappings. Um, and then it runs and executes all the transforms that are present, um, and then merges that parsed and mapped transformed config over the top of config.exs. And then all that is output to sysconfig. So real quick. This is what the configuration looks like. This is a really simple one. Um, you can have you know lists of things like let's say this is ports instead of you know port. You can do something like this, right? Um, and there's a lot of complex 
settings that you can use with this. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on those right now, but the configuration covers a lot of that. You can also reference the test and conform. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different scenarios that I test against, uh, just for examples. So this is nice and clean, right? We've got uh, just a few settings. Um, there's actually some that are hidden here, but it's really readable and easy to get into. Um, and these documentation comments are actually generated from the schema. These aren't things that I manually typed in. Uh, right. So schema.exs is the schema file, um, and it looks just like an Elixir data structure, basically. Um, we've just got a keyword list, and the top level settings are extends, import, mappings, and transforms, and validators. Um, extends and import, I'm not going to go into right now, but it's how you extend a schema um, or import applications uh, to be used as part of transforms or validators in this schema. Um, one of the things to keep in mind with releases is that uh, you might reference an application here that's not explicitly defined in your schema or in your uh, application dependencies. You can do that here, um, and when conform runs, it will make sure that that application is application code is packaged along with the schema. And you can see here, like, let's just look at this chat.url.host setting. Chat.url.host is what the user is going to see. Um, and then we've got some documentation, and this two keyboard is where that setting is going to go. Um, and you can think of this as like a, a key path, right? Um, so your output of this setting is going to be a keyword list of chat, elixir.chat.endpoint, URL and then host and then the value. Um, this is not very user friendly, right? It kind of exposes the internals of your application. Um, you don't want a module reference in your user facing uh, configuration. Like what happens if you want to change which module handles this endpoint or something like that? Um, now your users have to change their configuration. It's just not ideal. So you can expose a more simple setting that reflects what you're trying to do. Um, and then behind the scenes, do what you need to do um, to hide that complexity. We define the data type for setting, uh, same default if we have one. Uh, an example of like using hidden here is this chat.url.root is hidden, and uh, you can see that it's not in here. Uh, let's see if there's a good example. Um, you can put module names in here. Um, integer values. I don't know if I have an example of like a list in here. Um, like I was saying, it's not necessarily important to cover what the possibilities are as far as data types and so on go. Um, it's more important that you know that it's possible to do transforms and validate uh, your uh, provided settings in the .conf. Um, I'm not going to show you the transforms um, or the validators right now. Just it's sufficient to know that they're effectively just functions. And you define them um, as key value pairs in those areas of the schema. Go ahead. Oh, fine. No, sorry. Um, I think that's all I really have for now. Yeah, thanks, everybody.